Welcome to the Decoding Innovation podcast series, brought to you by the EY Nottingham Spurk Innovation Hub, where we explore the innovative technologies, business models, and ideas that are shaping the future of industries. During each episode, Mitali Sharma, a principal in the EY Parthenon strategy practice, meets with stakeholders at the cutting edge to discuss innovations in their space, challenges they need to overcome, and their outlook on the future. Hello, I'm your host, Mithali Sharma, and the topic today is Metaverse. Our guest is Urho Kontori, the founder and CTO of Warjo. Warjo makes AR VR products and services for professionals. Welcome, Urho, and thank you for your time today. Of course, thank you. Let us start with the basics. Would you mind describing, in your own words, what Metaverse means to you? And how is Vario playing in this space? Yeah, so for us, uh, Metaverse is the next iteration of internet, human communication, and basically bringing the uh, mixed reality technologies together with the full connectivity of, of the internet, and then uh, simultaneously uh, making the next digital transformation in the industry to move towards uh, more virtual goods as opposed to physical goods realm. But uh, as, as mentioned, it's a very broad topic and you could, of course, only just call it the next generation of computing. And that would be probably as equally encompassing as the metaverse term. Udho, can you tell us a little bit about your journey so far? Yeah, so Vario was founded roughly six years ago. We had the first day in the company on the 1st September 2016. And now the company has grown to be the industry leader in the business-to-business -business mixed reality devices. We have over 200 employees. Uh, the business is going pretty strong. I think we're all extremely proud that we have been able to grow a real new segment into the domain of virtual computing uh, that is business-to-business uh, -business mixed reality and virtual reality devices and their services. And now we're on the journey to move uh, the compute away from the local pieces you might have uh, at your VR labs or, or at your desks and move that one to the cloud so that you get the infinite compute available to you instantly the extremely fast connectivity. And then of course, all of that being part of our journey to untether the devices and make those really lightweight, comfortable and uh, usable everywhere. That is interesting. So if we can take one step back and talk about how you got involved and how the idea came about, um, if you can take us through that journey a little bit. I was super curious about virtual reality all the time from like uh, my teenage years, reading books like Neuromancer, playing RPGs like the uh, Shadow Run, which are all about, both of these are about describing Matrix, which is this fully virtual, fully connected world that probably we would be calling metaverse today. But that was termed in the like uh, 80s, 90s uh, for the roughly the same thing, but all sci-fi nothing real. Now we are on the verge of the real. So uh, I had my touch of working on the domain at um, at my years at Microsoft. So working with these guys on, on a virtual reality platform that was actually becoming then later on reference platform for the likes of uh, other Windows mixed reality headsets. And then uh, at some point, I found the opportunity to, to fund my own company and thought that this is going to be the future. So I would really want to be participating on that transformation in the world. And Barrio became that uh, instrument uh, for, for my part of the transformation. Tell us a little bit how you came up with the name. <laughs> we... We had uh, our. We were at, uh, as founders looking for a good name that would be describing what we're all about. Simultaneously, we had done the first, very first demo of video see through mixed reality before we had funding. You need to do something to showcase what you're doing, and we did that one at uh, uh, office of one of our uh, friends, uh, which is called Umbra 3D. 
Umbra happens to mean in Latin shadow, and Vario happens to mean in Finnish shadow. And uh, the shadow is the one thing that the optical see-through uh, mixed reality devices like HoloLens or Magic Leap are simply unable to do because they're all about adding light into your existing field of view. Whereas our premise was to do devices with video see-through mixed reality that basically is all about the modern ways of doing things. So digitizing the world in real time, manipulating it so you can, for example, add a shadow, add an object, or, or remove things from it uh, altogether. Remove that chair, replace it with a new chair type of things. So, so uh, we thought that really like a shadow is one of those key differences that our technology path towards mixed reality is one of the unique things. So these two things happening roughly accidentally, and, and we were more excited about this, like a shadow term than actually thinking about that. That's actually where we came originally about. So it was happy coincidence in that way. So this is perfect segue. Um, do you think of shadowing as your competitive advantage and are there others? And how are you exploiting them? So, so when we started the company, we thought that we need to have a unique angle to our own. Well, well, like I had been doing dozens of mobile phones and other consumer electronics devices in my past. So had the other founders. So we know that the game, when you go towards the consumers, when you go head to head against the big boys, you ultimately end up in a state that, um, that the bill of materials, the cost of product becomes really instrumental key thing in your competitiveness. And, and you can never win as a small player against the big ones if, if the price is your only competitive advantage. So we thought that the best way is to play slightly different games. So not go for the consumers, not go for the low price point, but go for the ultimate quality instead. Mm -hmm. And thus, we set our vision that we want to be where everybody in the VR and mixed reality industry want to be in 10 to 20 years time. We want to be there from day one and we will have spare no cost on making that happen. So the price of the pr products will be whatever they will be, as long as we achieve couple of key things. One of them is human eye resolution. So once you reach the quality that people can actually see, you don't need to anymore improve on the quality, right? So let's go to the end game of the mixed reality technologies of the VR and AR. Let's go to the resolution that people cannot see any better resolution anymore. So this allows us to replicate things exactly as they would be if they were physical. And you cannot tell apart uh, a virtual thing from a physical thing when you're comparing those on our devices. So that's number one thing. The second thing that we are like completely unique about is the way that we approach mixed reality, or at least, well, we used to be completely unique. Now we see others moving in the same journey with us. But the fundamental path is using video see-through cameras in, again, extremely high quality, so that we can replicate your surroundings, digitize those in real times, and um, in individual milliseconds from a photon hitting the sensor, be able to show that on the display so that you don't have any disconnect between what you're doing or what is happening around you, but it's all the same way as you would be experiencing it with your just pure eyes. We just happen to have a digital copy of it, which again can be then augmented and changed and either added or uh, subtracted from that world. And, and that put us on, on a very unique path. And, and now we have been servicing the most demanding customers in the world originally, uh, and now for over a year, also very demanding consumers. Fascinating. So when you were thinking about creating the technologically advanced product, what was your concept of the minimal viable product that you wanted to bring to the market initially? Take us through that journey. 
It's a really interesting question. I haven't been asked that ever, I think, or pretty, pretty much ever. So um, we started with the idea, which was very different from what we executed. Idea originally was that everybody is moving towards mixed reality, yet developers have no means of experiencing a great quality mixed reality. So the original, like a seed investment discussion time idea was to do an add-on to existing competitors VR headsets to make them mixed reality capable. Great. And sell that at low price point. Great. So investors were excited on that one. We had a plan and then we had a think about the plan, which included like, let's throw some numbers on the wall and see how this plays out in a couple of years time. If we move to a domain, which is niche enough to be not interesting to the bigger companies of the world who focus on mainly like a software driven ecosystem. So driving uh, a new market, which in this case is the mixed reality um, uh, a market, and then enabling software developers to create solutions on top of that market. Now, to make that interesting, you need to have absolutely millions of units on the market, which means low enough price point, which again, like moves you to use technology choices that you can afford at a bill of materials of maybe 200 US dollars. Whereas our direction was that hey, let's look at the market that we can do with the 2,000 US dollars or even more. So let's take that price equation away. And then that allows us to do significant enough different choices than anybody else in the world. We did also realize that it also allows us to innovate com completely differently. So we have been very active in patenting technologies that re then relate to solving challenges that you face when you go to human eye resolution uh, levels in VR or mixed reality. So at the time that we formed the company, we were running at over 100 times the resolution of anybody else. So surprise, surprise, you also face new challenges when you do that. And then solving those then ultimately leads to new innovation that uh, can either be like a, a company secrets or patents. So thank you for um, giving me a lot of fodder to ask you further questions. So let us unpack the technology a little bit. When you are thinking about your patenting philosophy, are you thinking more in terms of you as being the aggregator of all the technology that's out there and then developing something on top of it? Or is it something else? Well, we consider that that we come with a relatively original path onto solving the optics challenges and then the data processing challenges in the like a mixed reality headsets themselves. And then throughout the last two years, we have faced that actually that part about moving the compute to be done not like a near the headset on a cable, like cable connected rendering, but moving that one to the cloud or other remote compute system like on-prem server farm or something like this it creates a, again like a completely new set of challenges like uh whereas we need to be sending equivalent to roughly 100 megapixels for each of the eyes and not at 24 or 30 frames per second but at 90 frames per second so the data load itself is like incredible and, and again, like uh, looking into how do you solve this one is an, we think, uh, quite unique challenge to us in the like early days uh, of this one, maybe in five years, will be faced by everybody else in the industry. But again, because we face it for the first time, it also means that we get to be the company that is the first to do innovations and patents to really like really solve those things. Sometimes you can have more academic portions, whether companies or academic institutions doing solutions, but it's still a different thing when you need to solve it for a customer and it actually needs to be robustly. And you mentioned about your um, cloud services and your software services. How are you thinking about that, both in terms of technology and your business model? 
Yeah. So I think the cloud is, is it has a potential to be completely now changing the compute paradigm in the course of next 10 to 20 years. So not, not looking into like an instant change where we still today have our mobile phones that still like do most of the processing on the phones. And then we have the uh, computers, the laptops and so forth, where again, most of the computer is local and just data and synchronization is done on the cloud. Now, simultaneous to that, you see the trend of, for example, services like GeForce Now, Stadia, and uh, similar cloud rendering and gaming platforms that are changing the way that the actual, like a game is executed, how, where it is running. Is it running on the box that you buy to your home or is it running on a cloud where an instance is spawned or sharded for that moment where you need to use it? And then it's used for something else for the rest of the time. Like if I look at how I, my gaming habits, I might play like a one hour a, a day if I'm lucky. But that thing that I have purchased mm -hmm. to my home is then sitting idle or actually like probably wasting a little bit of electricity by sitting in the corner. So unused. But again, the whole cost has been bought just as if I would be using that computer all the time. And that's, of course, like the like the huge value that cloud brings to anything like and everything. And I do see that that also applies very interestingly into the metaverse, where, again, you can have that almost infinite compute available on lightweight devices um, at any moment. And, and you, can, you can expand the compute as needed, or you can reduce it to have lower cost levels. Um, so again, like, and, and updating the hardware becomes uh, settings update, not actually purchasing new computers, but decision to use the more modern services. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, when we look in, in the, this trajectory where we first now are moving the gaming to be more cloud driven over the next maybe five years, maybe this is the last console generation for really like the high power consoles. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But the, but the trajectory is similar to our current thinking or where, of where the mixed reality is going as well. Um, I'd maybe add, this is uh, maybe technological babble, but it's really interesting when you consider metaverse where everybody's thinking we can jump to like different places instantly and meet our friends who can be uh, photorealistically looking and, and have all their uh, like a, personal expression available on how they look and how they behave. And um, that's great. But again, like data needs to be synchronized. And uh, if you don't have like uh, tens of gigabits of connection, then you have you you are basically stopping your flow whenever you go to a new place and and it's not necessarily a great experience. Whereas if the compute is actually done on the cloud, Whenever you're jumping, you're then benefiting from the like a great uh, network infrastructures that these big cloud companies have been creating. And you're not synchronizing on megabits per second or gigabits per second. You're synchronizing at hundreds of gigabits per second. So everything, all data synchronization is instant when the computer is done on the cloud. And it's I, I do believe it's it's one of the things that can be like a radically interesting in the future, uh, like a, as part of that cloud compute offering. And so is that how you're getting rid of the latency issues that most people have? Maybe our biggest innovation on data transport is is at the moment in using the uh, eye tracking. So because that's one of the fundamentals that we built really early on on facing the compute challenge on the headsets to know that where the user is actually looking with their eyes that's the only place that the quality needs to be perfect just to give a, a, a like a rough example of the like a difference is that on the place that you look at 
you see 10,000 times higher resolution than you see in the periphery. So, so when you utilize that one, you can reduce the compute tremendously by focusing the quality on where it matters. And the same thing, again, applying to data transport. So if a person is looking at, at uh, like a particular object in the scene, why should we set, need to send the whole rest of the image in as high quality? Because they don't actually experience it at all in high quality. That has been one of the key things moving us from needing to send actually like a hundred megapixels uh, images down to like a normal video stream quality stream just happens to be very much what we call foveated. So utilizing that uh, eye gaze position to know where the quality needs to be and then reducing it where you don't actually perceive it at all. And you need to try things that might fail. I think it's one of the most important learnings in an innovative company is that you must be able to fail. And I, I, I learned really great lessons in, in my years at Microsoft where I had, um, my mandate was to fail at least 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. So like a, if you succeed with pro your projects more than 50%, then, then uh, you don't meet your targets. So you must be like pushing yourself to the limit and beyond that one. So, so that we learn something in the uh, course of, of the uh, activities. I, and, and when you do that one for like five years, then you develop this kind of like a detachment from, uh, from like uh, your dearest projects. You're fine if they fail. They sometimes fail, sometimes they succeed. And, and the successful ones are all the more glorious when they do but uh but for that reason we are pushing for the kind of technology path that we think might have only like a small chance of succeeding but then the bets that we place as a company on execution need to be the ones that we know will succeed so that's why i i think playing these different time periods is crucial so changing tracks a little bit in terms of you you described your funding um, you know, you mentioned your funding initially. Can you take us through that journey? Because as a founder, you were not only involved in the technology side of it, but I'm sure you were involved in the trials and tribulations of getting the business off the ground. Yeah. So, so maybe taking those slightly separate. So, or maybe we can actually combine those to a degree. So, mm -hmm. so we we started in 2016. We had uh, the first million in the pocket. My co-founder had just read a book called How to Raise Your First Million Outside of Silicon Valley, like a day before. And then we realized it was far too easy. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we basically raised that one to like uh, create a technology path for ourselves. And the first year was all about making technology. The second year uh, where we raised uh, roughly 8 million, uh, which was led by EQT Ventures, um, that was all about creating the product. So creating everything else except the core technology, because it's a, it's a long journey and you need to also find the team that is able to execute. So hiring takes time and, and uh, a year goes uh, by very fast when you, when you do both development and hiring at the same time. So um, great. So no customers, but we started reaching out gradually to companies that had been contacting us because of some of the publicity. We had been showing some of the prototypes to the press, creating a little bit of halo for the company during that year, basically also helping us hire because nobody goes to stealth hardware startups like nobody. Uh, so you need to become visible. So that year we became visible. We announced ourselves to the world. We met mainstream press, technology press, and, and created like um, this kind of vision of the ultimate quality uh, in the mixed reality domain as, as a kind of a company vision, which again, like uh, when you have a strong vision, it's easier to like pull people behind that vision, both internally as well as to hire. Um, and, and then that did lead to many companies 
reaching out to us. Hey, I read that you're able to do human eye resolution VR or mixed reality. Uh, it's a it's a dream for us. Like uh, we have been working in this car company X for for years, uh, and and this has been the dream. So can you come and show our technology to us and um, which is crucial because then you can start to have the discussion on how the product fits to the market and, and discuss about what we're executing. And we tried to be quite open about the things. And we even shipped some test units to some early customers during that year. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Series B funding again one year later, uh, which was led by one of the most renowned technology investors in Europe. And, and that money was all about entering the market, building the factory that makes the product that we had designed. So, so going to the market um, and then, then starting to actually learn from the actual paying customers as well. That was really interesting journey. What, what was then um, all about then for the next round was like market expansions, more investments, uh, as well as uh, acquiring a little bit of acceleration from other companies and, and building the sales organizations. One of the things that we kind of uh, like uh, did not realize fully well uh, early on uh, is that in business to business sales, you need to have a lot of legs on the ground. Mm -hmm. It seems also obvious today, but was not so obvious uh, in the early days, you kind of thought that, hey, we bring the technology to the market and people come to us always. Great. It does not work like that in the real world. So you need to actually go to the customers, no matter what's your business. Uh, and and uh, we hired a lot of great talent in the sales team, support teams. And, and yeah. So um, do you own the data? that comes to you or does the original company own it? How are you thinking about privacy? We are like very conscious that uh, all data is owned purely by the companies that, that actually use the data. Mm -hmm. and, and we have gone to extreme lengths to make it so that we can prove that we cannot even access the data with like our master keys, we cannot ever enter the data when it's in use and and it is really customer's data. It's the only way to also like uh, create a good liability protection. Like uh, you could foresee right. that leak of a new product from almost any company right. could be very detrimental for their business of the previous version of the same thing, which is what companies typically do. They have the next thing lined up and and like uh, this kind of Osborne effect can kill companies. And then of course, you don't want to be liable about that one. So our way has been to make that impossible so that it, at least any attack cannot come through us. Can we go back to something you said a couple of minutes ago? You talked about lessons learned. So if you had to do the process again, what would you do differently? <laughs> uh, of course, you could say that it's it's really difficult to change anything, but I, I, I think I would be more serious about uh, hiring sales teams before there is even a product. It hmm. kind of sounds so like uh, unrealistic, mm -hmm. but raising the like uh, know-how how to sell mm. always means that the sales teams need to be meeting the customers. They need to be discussing with the customers of their needs and then forming their point of view on how to help uh, the customers challenge, uh, like uh, solve those those challenges that they have. So I think we would have easily accelerated our business side by a year had we actually hired the salespeople at the time that they didn't have anything to sell and they would have just concentrated on meeting the customers, creating the like uh, relations with them, creating the rhetoric, learning the technology, using it, having the time to actually build that sales organization. Maybe in hindsight, 
we would have accelerated the whole company uh, a year by doing that one with just a couple of people uh, mm -hmm. a year sooner than we did. So other than that, I have really few regrets. I think we have been performing remarkably well over the years. So as you are thinking of developing with customers, um, how do you think of your solutioning? It seems like it's a very customized solution. Is it 80% standard with 20% wraparound? Or do you start from scratch every time a new problem comes up? No, it, like we're very standards compliant. So you can run any PC VR application beautifully on our headset. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or mixed reality uh, application. This is like a huge benefit to standards, which are in this segment, Open VR and Open XR. And Open XR especially is now the like uh, main standard being used by everybody in the industry, whether they develop uh, for mobile or for PC. And, and it enables the software developers to have majority of the code to be the same across every single platform and then optimize for certain devices slightly differently. For example, in our case, um, utilizing, for example, eye tracking for data analytics or during use analytics, then of course that's separate from the devices that don't have uh, eye tracking capability, or then utilizing our foveated rendering pipeline, where you need to basically provide two additional image buffers whenever you're rendering a scene, um, that we basically tell that this is the place that we would want to have more detail on. Uh, and, and again, in these kind of cases, you're basically using the rest of the same, exactly the same code as everybody else, and then adding two bits into those code pipelines. Sometimes it can take like uh, hours or a couple of days to do, and sometimes it can be a bigger effort. But like majorly, um, all more complex softwares are very modular, so it's relatively easy to plug in these kind of like individual things, and and that's for sure the like a uh, uh, the way forward uh, from for now and in the future. Then we have some like a more special things that are executed purely in our code lines. And then on those, of course, we do the work and, and then we may have uh, one new API for you to call like uh, toggle on chroma key or things like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you think about development or technological or actually even ecosystem developments in the metaverse and as it relates to AR, VR, what are you most excited about? Hmm. I mean, I <laughs> this is kind of like the kid in me talking now. Uh, like, I'm excited about like this, like, uh, like uh, the future of of like uh, communication, working with your colleagues, meeting your friends, meeting the relatives that you typically don't meet these days at all looking into how metaverse can be that like universal forum where you can have again more interpersonal communications i i miss it so much due to these covid years that we have been living all like i haven't been meeting most of my friends for years and and then you eventually learn that you have like a lost the touch into their daily lives and and like uh, ability for metaverse to be that place where we can all go and meet each other the same way as we have like always in our past been doing, but do that very quickly and meet the people no matter where they are in the same way. So democratizing distance or, or location. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I, I, I'm really looking forward to that angle in the metaverse. The, like maybe the most, maybe then the second most is moving the physical goods, the kind of like unnecessarily things that we uh, fill our homes with and moving that one into be purely virtual. So I want that poster, like I I, I could be like a, buying a poster to my home, I hang it on the wall and then I'm bored with it the next day type of thing. So 
instead of doing that one in the physical realm, I would want to do those kind of things in the purely virtual thing. But again, we are very far from that being comfortable and and like nice to do so that you can actually wear uh, uh, headsets throughout your day. That's years to come. <laughs> but when it does become possible, I'm really looking in this like a virtual goods ecosystem and the transformation that that will apply uh, or imply to our everyday lives. So that's going to be really interesting. So your vision of the future world as we all walk around with a little headset I, I could see that uh, as not necessarily all throughout the day, mm -hmm. but so that like a major parts of the day, you can actually be enhanced in a uh, like a world more suitable to you. So mm -hmm. adapting the world to your needs rather than you having to like only always adapt to the pressure of the surroundings. And what about resistance from accepting your product where has it come from most you mentioned regulation how you you know working with the military or the um, or the defense industry has helped you maybe circumvent the regulations um, that are much more prevalent in the commercial area but tell us a little more about what else has is impacting the acceptance of your product well, it, it's a usual thing. So business to business is land and expand market. So it's the like um, it's really important that you get your products to customers. It typically is one or two units in the beginning. Then they use it in some kind of test lab. Some early on experts use it. Then they give testimony, showcase it a little bit internally. Then a yeah. uh, first pilot is issued that this is going to be the 10 or 20 units and we're going to be like uh, testing the impact. Then eventually you get to like these expansion deals. So that's a huge thing. Now, what has impacted us has been COVID. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that, of course, the companies have had their purse strings tightened a little bit due to the COVID throughout the years. And then the more difficult thing is that you haven't been able to get that like um, effect of once you have sent those one or two units to the companies, they haven't been able to showcase those internally. But you don't get that like uh, viral mm -hmm. uh, like influence inside the organization that you must typically do in a thing like this when you're. When you want to change the way a company behaves, whether it is training or design or research, then it needs to be experienced by more than just a couple of experts for somebody to approve money expenditure. And, and that's the one of the things that we have really been missing. And it was only at the end of last year that we saw finally this veil of COVID lifting from us. Very um, interesting. So. And and going forward, I guess, not going forward, just even now, what keeps you up at night? If I would be like uh, picking one of the things, it would be like, what's going to be the next radical shift in the company's like a story? Like uh, mm -hmm. for a company like Wario, you, we have grown to a certain level we are VC funded, which means that there is always like a, some pressure of looking how to also make something out of the investment. So you start seeing this uh, pressure like uh, gradually piling up. And, and again, like the economic situation of the world does not help. So you see that that uh, uh, pressure is there. And then you have the two parts that at some point need to be chosen. Either you want to like go do an IPO, do, do an exit for the VCs through mm -hmm. that one, or then you need to look for how the company could become like a bigger company together with somebody else, either like a merger of, of I don't know, various mid-sized companies, but let's, let's call it mid-sized company for the sake of argument, like a combining two mid-sized companies and then maybe looking for an IPO or or then becoming part of something like a much bigger. And that's maybe one of the things that does keep me like uh, very 
very conscious and 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 is is on the back of the head it, it doesn't trouble me at night but mm -hmm. it is one of those like uh, things that i'm very aware that could be potentially like disturbing my sleep but does not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and what would be your advice for somebody starting up an innovator or an entrepreneur who's thinking about starting something i I think it's really important that like an innovator should be choosing a path of their own rather than following an existing path. Uh, it's 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 going to be a short journey if you follow the same path as as everybody else. So like especially entrepreneurs, they need to have a very strong point of view and and point of view that is different than other people. It could be that that you radically, of course, could be like optimizing something. Well, then you can follow the same trajectory as everybody else, but you are probably very orthogonal on your execution. So that's that's uh, obviously great. But I I would say like uh, choose your path relatively early on and, and follow that one um, strictly. And and don't be afraid if you like lose my my like. Every time when I have been like on on the various journey, I've only only been thinking that we're now going to be like uh, running as fast as we can to the direction that we have set, and uh, this way we can be faster than the big companies, and that's the only like possible way for a start to move forward. Pick a path, follow that one, see where it leads, and and then if it doesn't lead in, into anything great, then. Um, you, you have venture capitalists that take the risk for you. That's their whole point. And they're also happy to, to move on to the next thing. And, and if they have invested the only in little bit in you, it's, it's, it's fine. They are looking at one in 20 type of success rates. So mm -hmm. they'll be also like, nobody will be blaming you for failing mm -hmm. most, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Urho, it's this this has been a fascinating conversation and I wish we had more time. Um, hopefully we can talk to you again. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The Decoding Innovation Podcast Series is a limited production of the EY Nottingham Spurk Innovation Hub, based in Cleveland, Ohio. For more information, visit our website at ey.com slash decoding innovation. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe leave a review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to spread the word.